And I'm mm. I'm just an undergraduate student uh, studying in the US. <laughs> okay. So yeah, cool. I'm actually majoring in philosophy and astrophysics. So, oh, nice. Yeah. I was going to ask whether you guys have any sort of formal um, education in philosophy. Or no, none of us has except Manny. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And um, just a question about like the audience, because I did sort of browse through your channel a bit, and obviously not much of it's in like English, the content. Yeah. Yes. So yes. presumably your audience can speak English, or you wouldn't have brought me on. Um, yeah. But should yeah. I try and speak slowly and they understand not... English? Yeah. Will oh they yeah. Follow I mean... what I'm saying. Yeah, I think I think so. they understand English, and if if, if we need, if we find that okay, we need some subtitles, we will add subtitles. Okay, yeah. cool. Or and if you want to break it down English. further, yeah, 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 yeah. We yeah. can ask you. We can ask uh, you anything further. that I say that you don't understand. Don't just let me keep going because um, there's no point in me talking and you're not understanding it. So I'm more than happy to try and explain things more simply. That's absolutely fine. There's you know, it's not stupid to say that. Uh, it's bad if, in fact, if a philosopher can't explain what they're saying in in more than a couple of different ways. So I'm very happy to do that. Yeah. Okay. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So, so can you introduce your work? Because uh, we, uh, I personally uh, got introduced to your work when I was browsing through, you know, works on Kalam. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and so maybe can you give a little bit of introduction about? Uh, what is your area? What are your areas of interest, and what do you do? Okay, so um, I uh, <clears throat> had, so I I was at university studying philosophy. Um, so I did a undergraduate degree in philosophy, and then a, a master's degree, and then I did a PhD. Um, and my work at that point was in so my PhD work was in like formal logic and metaphysics. So I was interested in um, the philosophy of time and and modality. So that's things about like what's poss possible, what's necessary, and how that relates to the passage of time. So broadly speaking, you know, as time passes, as things go, you know, gradually go on and on, things that used to be possible at one point stop being possible, right? And you know, it's it's a one way street, right? That you're your um, future range of possibilities narrows as time passes, right? So it's it's too late now for me to be a child concert pianist, right? Because I'm too old. That's it's just not a possibility I have anymore. But it used to be possible when I was a child to be a 50 year old pianist, and it's still possible now. I've still got 10 years. I could I could come to terms with that. So there's this relationship between time and possibility, and that's what I was. Uh, exploring in my PhD, and that involved working with um, formal logic, basically, where the um, underlying structures for those logics uh, resemble like trees. So they branch towards the future, and they're sort of linear towards the past. And that reflects this idea that there are possibilities, alternative possibilities in the future, but that the past is settled. And there's just one um, actuality behind you in the past or something. So that's that's what I worked on when I was doing my PhD and I published a few papers and worked on stuff then. Um, and I was, I had a few teaching positions um, and then I, I changed career and I quit academia. Um, so this is 10 years ago. And since then I've been doing different things, but I came back to philosophy, um, I don't know, five or six years ago and rediscovered the philosophy of religion and that was a fun topic it was different and there was this like youtube like uh, stuff so there's people debating each other and it was a bit more fun back and forth and um there's obviously loads of it you know in certain circles anyway i guess there's loads of like christian apologetics content and i'm not religious at all never been religious and it seemed to me that a lot of the time my knowledge of philosophy was useful in explaining why some of those arguments weren't very good. Um, so I got into uh, writing about philosophy of religion and started publishing a few papers in my spare time, sort of on the side of my job. Um, and so I've yeah, published some stuff on the Kalam, a couple of papers, 
um, on that. I just recently had one accepted, I think yesterday. So there's another one coming out. Um, and I've also written about other issues like uh, divine conceptualism, which is a, about the nature of abstract objects. And some theists think the best explanation of that is that they are ideas in God's mind or something. So I wrote some stuff about that as well. Um, yeah, so hopefully that helps explain a bit about my background. Yes, uh, so I, I just have a clarif clarifying question. Right, so basically, you were not really interested in philosophy uh, of religion when you were pursuing philosophy. You, know, you came yeah, right. back to philosophy of religion when you saw the arguments and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Right, okay, yeah, that's interesting. It was like YouTube content that got uh -huh. me back into philosophy of religion. You know, like yeah. um, this kind of presuppositionalist stuff ah. i don't know if you're familiar with that but um oh yeah there's this not, right um uh, forgot his name. Dawkins. Darth 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 Dawkins. Dawkins. Yeah. Darth Dawkins. yeah people like <laughs> that yeah 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 i mean uh, what what do you guys feel about using bad language can i swear on your channel or should i yeah, oh sure. yeah oh, okay. yeah <laughs> yeah okay so there's this there's this asshole um side 10 <laughs> you know him <laughs> <laughs> you heard that guy but anyway he's he's a complete yeah. he's a big idiot yeah. not hustling i think we had a small discussion with yeah him. we had few encounters yeah. with him in club in clubhouse like we, yeah. we used yeah. to have discussions in clubhouse i see yeah yeah yeah, yeah and that, yeah. that type of thing kind of triggered me back into being uh, uh -huh. in philosophy again you know it's like if yeah. people like that are getting away with you know amateur level stuff like that i yeah. you know, could probably do some something helpful or, or whatever i don't know also you yeah. have your own uh youtube channel like thoughtology series and mm -hmm. i haven't yes. done anything on that for ages but yes it's still uh -huh. there technically in the background I, yeah. I, occasionally i think about resurrecting it but um yeah work work has got me busier these days so I'd yes, less time you you also have a blog called use of reason right yes yeah. yes <laughs> even and, longer and, since i went to that but yeah absolutely. yeah that's true so, so uh, i borrowed a quote from your blog like you said that uh, philosophy uh, is to expose the folly of arrogance like as a grenade mm -hmm. it can go off from your own hand so yeah <laughs> yeah so i like the code i actually put in my bio for a few few times yeah <laughs> okay cool. Very nice. yeah. yeah yeah so um i have question uh, many you were going to ask something or Oh yeah, um, you know, I was just saying. I think we have similar histories. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. the reason why we started this project uh, in India is because of um, apologetics like this. You know, like dishonest apologetic strategies. Yeah. You know, sort of like these arguments that say, okay, I mean, philosophy dictates that you have to be a theist. You can't be a naturalist, mm -hmm. right? You're irrational. William Lane Craig kind of proved that you know christianity <laughs> is true so you can't get away from it all these yeah. atheists are you know have they have lost it you know <laughs> that kind of apologetic that's what you know triggered us into <laughs> you know counter apologetics and defending naturalism and so on yeah cool very cool yeah so so um uh, alex if somebody comes and asks you what is the relevance of philosophy we, in today's age like you you have science explaining stuff why, who cares about philosophy? So how would you respond to that question? Um, well, yeah, okay. So um, philosophy does a bunch of stuff that's, um, it looks at questions that for various reasons are not um, applicable to scientific investigation. So there'll always be additional questions that are beyond the purview of science. I mean, Presumably, who knows how science is going to change over the future or whatever. But um, typically things like questioning values that people have or, you know, the meaning, uh, deeper meanings behind the concepts that we've got. These are not empirical questions where you can do an experiment to find out what the answer is. Um, finding the answer is m messy and often there's questions about which methodology you should use to answer those questions. So there are questions you know, going quite far down the, like you can question things about the questions that you're asking. Does this even make sense to ask these types of questions? And what does it mean to make sense to ask these types of questions, blah, blah, blah. So it's naturally, um, philosophy is just like um, a collection of different areas 
um, that have more or less to do with each other, but that basically are all uh, a big bucket that you put things in when you don't know how to deal with them empirically. So, um, you know, take philosophy of mind, for instance, like what, you know, questions about the nature of consciousness or whether we have free will, um, those types of questions, maybe there's some room that you can make through empirical investigations. And like, if you can, then cool, that's fine by me. I'm not trying to say that you have to do one or the other, but it's more that like at a certain level, the empirical uh, progress gives way and all, all you can do to try and make any further progress is, is use your own like thinking and reason and see if you can illuminate uh, any any deeper down without the use of um, scientific supports. So there's like, it seems to me that they're complementary. Like at some level, um, scientific questions like bleed into philo philosophical questions. Like um, you have philo philosophy of physics, for instance, is questioning the kind of concepts that underlie our physical theories. Um, and it's, there's it, the boundary kind of moves as science changes and as people's appraisals come and go. But like, you sometimes you can be doing physics and wander off and find yourself doing philosophy of physics because you're asking questions that are about physics, but they're not straightforwardly empirical. Um, same same sort of thing with mathematics, right? It's like got its own discipline and its own methods and stuff, but um, occasionally you can ask questions that go beyond those methods about the nature of mathematics. Um, and, and then you're doing something which, like my wife did a PhD in the philosophy of mathematics, but could have been done, it was done in the philosophy department, but it probably could have been done in the mathematics department. You know, it's one of those areas where, you know, the, there's not really much to tell between uh, people who are practicing scientific disciplines and those people who are practicing the kind of philosophy of those scientific disciplines. So, so it just seems to me there's a kind of spectrum and philosophy is at the messy end where <laughs> everything's up for grabs. There's no expert. No one can really agree on anything that much. And it's all interesting questions and big questions about life. The, deepest level of reality, meaning, those types of things. And in the different directions that those messy questions point, often there's settled methodologies where you can investigate it concretely with empirical science or whatever, and you can find stuff out. Um, but yeah, always at some level, it disintegrates into a big messy kind of uh, conceptual ground where people are still fighting over uh, everything. And that, that's philosophy in, in my view. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, so this, there's a, uh, you know, sub question related to it. So it, you know, people can ask then what is metaphysics then, mm -hmm. you know, and <laughs> how is it relevant? Uh, because here, when somebody says metaphysics, they are trying to explain some supernatural, you know, phenomenon. You're saying hey, this is what we are telling is not physical things. We are talking about metaphysical things. Okay. So they are using metaphysics as supernatural uh above and, physics and, uh yeah <laughs> yeah above it's 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 you know unrelated beyond to physics. physics beyond right. physics and beyond uh yeah. you know natural reality so, so they say that's what we are talking about and atheists cannot understand metaphysics so uh, okay <laughs> how do you how do you how do you address that question if somebody nah. presents this to you well yeah, okay, so there's like some kind of families of use for the word metaphysics. So on the one hand, you see metaphysics being used in connection with things like um, meditation and yoga and stuff like this. And what they're talking about there is a kind of religious uh, token. It, does, it doesn't really mean very much. It's like the term spiritualism or something. It's, you know, it's just a kind of word without much theory going on that's just there to you know make a practice sound more uh, respectable or something in my view it doesn't that's just as kind of completely separate nothing to do with metaphysics in analytic philosophy um there as you're gesturing to it's like has this sort of etymological root like the kind of origin of the word um metaphysics is comes from this kind of like 
well, meta meaning kind of beyond or about or something, and, and physics meaning the study of like um, causes and effects or something along those lines. And what that's really going back to is classification of Aristotle's work, right? So Aristotle, this like ultimate Greek philosopher guy, lots of his work was maintained through the Middle Ages. So he's been incredibly influential for it for throughout the whole of Western civilization. Um, he has a book called The Physics. And then there was another collection of notes taken by a student in his lectures, which were about more fundamental questions. And that collection of notes was compiled together at some point in, you know, absolutely ages ago, I don't know, fourth century or something, I don't even know when, compiled together um, into a book and basically placed onto a library and classified by a librarian as belonging after the physics book. So it literally just means the next one on the shelf in this library after the physics one. That's that's why he called it metaphysics, because it didn't have a name. It's not a book that Aristotle wrote. It's just a collection of notes that somebody else wrote whilst attending his lectures. But we call that a book by Aristotle and we call it the metaphysics. Now, commonly, we, we use the term metaphysics now to pick out the subject matter that Aristotle was talking about then. Um, but yeah, it's you know the the etymology is strange. It's it's a bit of a weird word. It doesn't have any real connection to these other sort of metaphysics, or it doesn't just straightforwardly mean like um, there's there's matter or material or something. And then if you believe in uh, anything beyond that, like a god or something, then that's metaphysics, and physical stuff is not metaphysics. That's not right. It's not following a simple classification like that because you can have um, talking about the, you could talk about the metaphysics of physical reality, and if you think that the world is made up of I don't know atoms, and they have one or two fundamental properties like position and mass or something like that, then that's a metaphysical view um, about physics. It's talk. It's basically think about it like maybe stuff as it is um, at its deepest level, like as it really is without anything getting in the way that that's kind of what metaphysics is supposed to be about it's you know you might think that um you know uh, on on some level for stuff looks like it's physical just because like you can't get things through it there's something in the way so that that's what we mean by something that's physical but you might know enough physics to know that really if you look at this carefully there's loads of space in between all of the atoms and actually, it's really kind of just like a field or something. It's really just energy. And the, the fact that I can't like push my finger through my hand isn't doesn't really mean that there's something there that's in the way. It's a kind of like an explanation in terms of mathematics of the physical theory, which explains the, 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 the interrelations there. Um, so you might say in itself, the deepest level of reality doesn't have these kind of impenetrable bodies like hands and fingers pointing at them, or whatever. There's something deeper than that. And it's it's energy or it's fields or it's atoms or something so you can you can still just focusing entirely just on physical reality you you have a range of kind of metaphysical views that are on the table for like what what it what's it actually like you know stripping away the illusion or the subjectivity of your own perspective what's it actually like in, in itself um that's what metaphysics is about and you know that's a very broad brush and it means that you can sort of apply metaphysics to lots of different things right so you know when we're talking about the nature of the mind when we're talking about philosophy of mind or something lots of that is metaphysics and it could easily fit into the metaphysics bucket rather than the philosophy of mind bucket or maybe they just overlap with each other um i guess we'll talk a bit later on about time and infinity and stuff like that and here that's you know it, that's also metaphysics it's also philosophy of mathematics they kind of like bleed into each other, but it's it's just questioning stuff um, at its deepest level. So yeah, that that's what yeah. I would describe it as. Yeah, yeah. Do you think? Do, yeah, do sorry, you think, man. Do you think it's accurate to say that metaphysics is you know the study of the fundamentals of physics? You know the fundamental concepts and the fundamentals of physics. It's, do you think it, that's accurate? It covers that. It's broader than that. It's not just the fundamentals of physics mm. because there would be. Um, other fundamental questions that come under metaphysics as well that are not mm. specifically about physics. So you might yeah. talk about um, 
the nature of truth or propositions and uh, that type of thing. It's not really physics, but it is mm. metaphysics. So right. I, I think while the fundamentals of physics do come under mm. metaphysics, it's an umbrella yeah. that's broader than that. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. I okay, think the easiest so... thing is just to like see lots of examples of what metaphysics is and sort of get your head around it that way rather than having a definition and that leading you to something, mm -hmm. right? Like yeah. propositions, mind, space-time, uh, morality, like all of these things can be metaphysical. Um, okay, uh, I think we can go to the arguments. Uh, so before, before that, um, so uh, here uh, the strategy is that uh, the apologists say that we have a deductive argument. So once we have a deductive argument, it's proven that this is the case. So, and you don't have any argument for atheism. And so, like we have cosmological arguments, we have, you know, design arguments, stuff like that. And mostly they are focusing on cosmological arguments. Uh, so, mm -hmm. so how do you uh, view these deductive arguments in deciding the existence of a god? Because all, uh, so we had a discussion with Graham Opie. So he said he don't believe in these arguments they, they don't play any role in helping us choose worldviews so how how do you see this uh, you know nature of arguments well <clears throat> i do think that arguments can be very useful i mean i like graham's views on this i find them very helpful um so i'm not just going to repeat stuff that he's probably already said to you because that wouldn't wouldn't be very helpful but i do think um so there's a, there's a limit to arguments. They have their place, um, but there's a limit to them. I, I, I'm not one of the type of people who thinks you can deduce very much just using arguments. Um, you, can, you can suggest things, and you can certainly have a view and defend that and come to, come to a position that seems the most reasonable to you. But I think that that's a long way away from you know, establishing beyond any doubt uh, certain things, right? So for instance, if we're talking about metaphysics, these big fundamental questions, like what's the ultimate nature of reality, blah, blah, blah. I just sort of, I kind of think my basic position, and it would take a lot to get me off this, is that you probably can't say for sure very much about that, even with arguments, even with really good arguments. A really good, really strong argument will provide less than completely compelling evidence for claims like this. Um, so, you know, what are the importance of arguments? They're, they're fun. They um, can expose when we think two contradictory things and we don't like that and we need to clean our uh, worldview up. We need to tidy things up so that it's uh, making more sense. And arguments can bring that out because they can show you that, well, if you believe this one thing, another thing would follow and you don't like the, the other thing that follows. So what are you going to do? You know, you're kind of in, a, in a, a pickle and you have to do something about that. So arguments can be useful for like um, cleanliness, the cleanliness of your own beliefs and your worldview, bringing out those tensions. But I don't see them as a particularly, it's, it's, they're not like a great truth seeking method for finding things out when there's kind of solemn you know, knight of truth who charges into battle and discovers these deep fundamental facts. I don't see it like that. Um, often it's quite nice to just do it, do, to investigate an argument um, for its own sake, just because it's interesting. And the questions that it brings up are independently interesting, not because uh, necessarily it's getting you somewhere. So I guess there's like one view of philosophy where what's happening is like cumulative, like each generation establishes something and the next one builds on that and the next one builds on that a bit like scientific or or kind of like mechanical processes or whatever and we've we we now know how to build planes and you know before that we had to build cars or something and like the the knowledge like builds one on the other um you could think philosophy is like that um but another way of looking at it is that philosophy is like um cleaning your room where you have to do it, but even if you do and you make your room perfectly clean, you're going to have to do it again next week and again and again, and it never goes away. Uh, but what's happening is you're kind of fighting against the messiness that's going to encroach on your space otherwise. 
so philosophy in it sort of makes progress but it's progress in in uh, doing something to keep it hygienic rather than sort of a linear progression that's taking you towards a destination um so yeah that's how i think of the things with these arguments it's it's so, fun to yeah, do so and you, it's good to not get caught in a trap or something sorry go on yeah so uh, you you are saying that these arguments will not give you like 100% surety on about metaphysics like you 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 can hold it as your personal view uh, but it doesn't convince the person with an opposite view is that what you're trying to say it probably won't yeah it probably won't convince people of the alternative view and i think it's um i think that's the mature thing to think is that an argument isn't going to um completely change your mind it might do but i mean most of the time it probably won't and i think modesty is the key here to be realistic about what you can and can't really know as a person you're you know you're a finite creature who's on who's awake and conscious for a very small amount of time realistically and some things you're never going to know you're just not going to know them it seems to me and um there's a kind of railing a psychological effect of like railing against that reality of being finite and trapped in something where you'll never fully comprehend it and people don't want to be like that so they want to think that they've got a key that will get them to the truth kind of shortcut through all of the the mystery and the ambiguity and find out what's really going on and i think sometimes people use arguments as if they are this special um cheat code or something which gets you to uh, establish the truth and i think that's all very arrogant and full of um kind of immaturity and sort of maybe fear about not understanding your position in the world or something and um yeah I'd, i'd rather just try and learn to live with that rather than trying to pretend that i've made my way through to the end or something does that make sense yeah yeah, yeah. accepting uh, the we, we... ambiguity in some issues right mm-hmm. so you have yeah. to accept that there, there, are, there are some issues that are ambiguous and you don't have like clear answers mm-hmm. to those questions you yeah. might... there is also a room for doubt the, the, yeah the, the issue that we have is like we have this uh, propaganda uh, that hey we have this argument so if this argument uh, is valid so and if you don't have any answers to the premises then this is logically proved that god exists or something like that and that's where uh, you know it is it's kind of hard to address such claims so mm. that's why we are you know asking professional philosophers what are your views on this <laughs> yes so yeah usually they come to... with like a, a kalam yeah. and they say see kalam see there so there's a god see the contingency argument so there is a god so mm-hmm. yeah what you said yeah. makes a lot of sense yeah Yeah, yeah. So, um, what's your view on contingency argument? Like, if somebody says, "Hey, uh, how would you address contingency argument?" Um, well, like um, you have contingent beings, and you need a necessary existence, existence to explain these contingent beings. Yeah. So, there's lots of different formulations of the argument, um, and I think they broadly it depends how you classify it. But like, they're kind of associated with this. a german philosopher called leibniz who is like a uh, 17th century i want to say um so well, maybe 1700s is what i mean anyway um an old old dead european guy and um he has this idea that basically um so so there's a distinction between things being contingent and things being necessary right and the distinction is that contingent things or contingently true things um they are true but they could have been false right like this this glass here has water in it but it could have had tea in it right it could have been false that it has water it's true that it has water but it could have been false and then there are other propositions like uh 1 plus 1 equals 2 that's true but unlike the glass of water case it's not true that it could have been the 1 plus 1 equals 3 or something right that's that's uh, it's necessarily true the 1 plus 1 equals 2 it's not contingent so armed with that distinction you can start to see the contours of the argument because there are lots of contingent facts and the thing about contingent facts is that um it certainly seems anyway when you start looking at them that each contingently true fact 
um, has something that explains why it's true rather than false. Right? It could have been false, um, but it is true. And that that means that there's something which explains why it's true rather than false. And so if you ask, why is this glass got water in it rather than tea or rather than not having water in it, then it's, you know, there's some explanation about what I did a few minutes ago, filling it up. And then if you ask why I did that, because that was contingent, I could have decided to do something different. Why did I do that? You, you know, do you find that you're starting to look at a chain, which is going back each step has, um, if it has a contingent thing that's doing the explaining, then you can ask a question again about that. Well, why is that this way rather than a different way? And so it invites this thought that it goes back and back and back, a kind of chain of explanations, where if each contingent thing is explained by a prior contingent thing, then um, we, we seem to have only a couple of different options, right? Either that chain just goes on forever and each contingent thing is explained by a prior contingent thing, but that chain just never ends, or as it might be, never begins. There's just a kind of never ending chain going back forever. Um, or it might go around in a circle where uh, the, the explanation sort of like loops back on itself and you find the first thing starts explaining the prior things um, in a kind of circular manner. Or the chain of explanations is gonna end somewhere and if it ends, then either it ends with you go contingent thing, contingent thing, contingent thing, and then it's just a contingent thing and nothing explains that. It's just standing unexplained. Or it goes all contingent thing, contingent thing, um, but then a contingent thing is explained by a necessary thing. And necessary things don't have explanations for them, right? Like there's nothing explains why two plus two equals four. It's not like because su such and such happened, then two plus two equals four, right? It's not depending on anything happening for it to be true. So nothing happening could be the explanation for it being true. So if your chain of contingent um, explanations terminates in something necessary, then that stops the, like, the search for explanation um, so this is basically Leibniz's idea is that, you know, it, but now now what the, the idea is basically, well, you just pick holes at the other options, right, and show that they're rubbish. <laughs> and then the necessary explanation one kind of wins by being the least rubbish one. So if you can say, look, there's something wrong with like this circular, like circle of explanations, and that's kind of, you know, I, that seems right to me. It feels weird to have like a really small circle of explanation, for instance, like, um, well, self-explanation, right? A, a single event, single contingent thing uh, can't explain itself. I mean, that just seems like it's difficult to even say why that's true, but it just seems obviously true, right? That why is my glass got water in it? because my glass has got water in it. It just doesn't feel like we're doing any kind of explaining there. But if we build, a, I mean, that's like the smallest possible circle. You could have one thing that referring to itself. We're just plugging in a bunch more things and ultimately still having the glass of water like explaining itself because it just goes around in a circle and gets back to itself again. It just feels like there's, it doesn't matter how big that circle is, ultimately you're just doing the same thing again, right? So you can, you can quickly find reasons that you want to abandon some of these options. Um, or if you take it where there's a chain that goes back only so far and then there's a first contingent thing and nothing explains that well now it kind of feels weird right because you know we always find contingent things have explanations and just sort of positing that some contingent thing happened without an explanation goes against the grain of our experience like we just don't see those things happening um, and it also feels like there's a big mystery that we haven't really explained it's awfully convenient that there's just something with no explanation, right? So it's sort of kind of suspect as, a, as an argumentative strategy to just say, well, maybe, you know, this thing happens, there's no explanation for it. Um, and likewise, you might think with the endless string of things, at least everything is explained, but, you know, then you could start asking questions about like, well, why is it this infinite chain of events rather than a different one? Why isn't the whole chain of events different to how it it actually is 
Um, so you might find that that's disappointing too. So then you might just, if you just stopped here, you might say, well, we had four options on the table, three of them are rubbish, so the last one must just win by default. And that's that's sort of kind of sometimes how the argument is presented. Spend a long time trying to tell you that the three options must be all wrong, and then just say, so, you know, obviously a necessary thing, that's, that's the explanation, that's the best explanation, that's the one that you should accept, and not say that much more about it. Um, so you can obviously question that though. I mean, if what the, if, if, if you're talking to a, say a Christian or a theist and they're saying, well, you know, the, the universe begins at a certain point in time where the God made it, um, said, let there be light and there was light and it started at that point or something. They might say, well, God made it this way rather than a different way. Um, because that was his choice. He decided to do it that way. Um, okay, so that then means that before the beginning of the universe, there's a free choice that God made. And that choice is, and even though God's existence is necessary, that choice was free. And that means that it could have been different. So you could ask, why didn't he choose differently to how he did, right? That's just a contingent thing. All that's happened is we've added another contingent thing uh, at the beginning of the universe. But if we're playing the same game we were playing a minute ago, we ask, well, why did God choose world A rather than world B, right? That's that's something that needs explaining as well. Um, and, you know, they don't want to they don't want to have to say, uh, well, there's a big chain of things that led up to God doing that. Right. It's because in the morning God got up and he was like really liked A things that day instead of B things. And you, you don't want to have any kind of story like that, because obviously it's not going to go anywhere. What they needed to do is terminate in something necessary. But if you say, well, look, God, by his nature, has to make this specific world and not a different one. Well, that's OK, because now you're terminating the sequence in something necessary. But then the problem is the whole world starts to become necessary then, right? because none of it could have been different. So actually, we started off thinking that the glass of water was contingent, but actually it's necessary because God made the universe exactly like this and not a different way so it's like this kind of call this a collapse a modal collapse argument you might hear this term sometimes where it's like if you've got um a necessary proposition and that proposition implies another proposition right if a is necessary and a implies b then it just follows by logic b is, that b is necessary yeah and and because of that people will say you can't really have God like being compelled and necessitated to pick one of these options, but it doesn't really work if he's doing it freely either, right? So actually, I think my view on this is that when you look at it, the kind of God explanation isn't really a distinct explanation. It's either uh, you get this collapse thing if what he's doing is necessary, or it just turns out to be no different to just saying, well, there's just this contingent fact that has no explanation for it like god just picks world a rather than world b because he did that's just nothing else you can say about it and if that's the, if that's right then you may as well just say there just is world a rather than world b because it is and there's nothing else you can say about it right it's not really not really doing anything so i think you know in some ways of putting this argument anyway um you find that the the necessary being explanation is actually no better than any of the others it doesn't really help because then we just got reasons to be, you know, we've got four distinct options and none of them look very good, right? But um, it's certainly not the case that like one of them wins and all of the others are rubbish. It just seems like we're all just very confused about this and it's not clear what we should say. Yeah. So yeah, even, yeah, even we share the same thing, like all the con most of the contingency arguments that they present has this, you know, issue of falling into model collapse cool. yeah so now about the kalam so it looks cool. as if uh so, so we know the kalam cosmology like everything that begins to exist has a cause the universe began to exist therefore universe has a cause and from your works it's it looks as if you are rejecting the premise to the universe began to exist because most of your work is all about infinite regressions and infinite causes uh you know defending those views uh, is that the correct understanding uh, yeah that you're defending? that's right so i would say it like this though that i'm not 
um, it's not so much that I'm rejecting the premise, but that I'm rejecting the reasons for thinking the premise is true. Right. So okay. it, it might be true, but I don't think the reasons given are good reasons to think that it's true. Okay. Yeah. So, um, and so when Kalam is presented in the particular, you know, YouTube or Facebook discussion, it's, it's presented as if infinite regression is a logical contradiction. Mm. So how would you address that? Like infinite regression is a logical contradiction. Yeah, I think it's, you know, usually a strategy peddled, peddled by William Lane Craig and his followers, you know, mm -hmm. actual infinities are logically impossible, right? So, you know, you can't have an actual infinity. The universe must begin to exist and so on. Yeah. What do exactly. you think about? Yeah. So, so in the William Lane Craig way of looking at things, right, there's two strategies he normally uses as philosophical arguments for, um, for showing that there couldn't be specifically an infinite past, right? Um, so that there must have been a beginning in time. Um, like often he appeals to scientific stuff, you know, like the Big Bang and blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to talk about that. Just looking at the philosophical things, he has two broad strategies, right? So the first one is to focus in on things related to the Hilbert's Hotel argument. And then the second one is this thing that's called the successive addition argument. Um, and I think that they're both uh, questionable and certainly no, it, you know, there's lots of room for honest, reflective, intellectual disagreement there at, at a minimum. And uh, I certainly think that, for instance, the Hilbert's Hotel argument, um, just there's no logical contradiction at all. I mean, even Craig thinks there's no logical contradiction there. And people saying that there is one, a misunderstanding what he's saying there. Let, let's say they, they bring some thought experiments. They say that if you have a moment now, it's it's impossible to have this moment if there is a beginningless past. Because uh, if it's beginningless, it will never complete. But you have the completed series of events. So there is, uh, so it's a contradiction. So you cannot have. So how do you address that question? Um, I think, yeah, I think it's good to, you know, kind of differentiate um, metaphysical impossibility and logical impossibility, yeah. right? Because right. Craig in his yeah. works, right, philosophical works, he talks about actual infinities being metaphysically impossible and lays out yeah. the reasons for that. And in his debates, you know, he just shifts to like logical impossibility, like right? actual infinities are not uh, possible logically, right? I think you responded to Craig in, in in a documentary, right? So you would know about that stuff, and and he kind of reacted to the documentary, and he admitted that, you know, he is only talking about actual infinities being metaphysically impossible. Yeah, right? that's right. I had a debate with William Lane Craig and he said it out explicitly when talking with me that it's it's a meta metaphysical impossibility, not a logical, like a strict logical impossibility. So it's not the case that like, um, uh, at least for these arguments anyway, it's not the case that like you suppose that an infinite past is possible and then uh, both p and not p can be derived from it like a contradiction straightforward contradiction like that that's not what's going on certainly with this hilbert's hotel style argument what happens is the consequences of the argument are absurd right they're like weird and like counterintuitive so you know infinitely many hotel uh, infinitely many guests can check out um and it can still be full that type of thing where it just doesn't seem right but it's not the same as saying as a contradiction, like some proposition and its negation at the same time. So that's kind of like one way that philosophers can come, come to agree that something is wrong is if it entails a contradiction. And he hasn't shown that it entails a contradiction and doesn't claim to uh, with, with this type of Hilbert's Hotel argument. So it's right off the bat there, 
um, it's yeah, there's this misunderstanding of, of what he's up to. And yeah, maybe he does switch in the debate mode to what he's saying. I don't know. I haven't watched all of William Lane Craig's debates. I've read some of his published philosophy and he doesn't say that type of thing in print. I can certainly say that. Um, and and in, when I talked to him, he didn't like try and say one thing different to, to Harry writes. He was he was consistent with Harry writes. So I can only speak to that. Um, on this argument where we couldn't have got to now if the past was infinite because it well <laughs> because it would have taken an infinite amount of time to get here it just seems to me that that's just what it means for there to be uh an infinite past it's like yeah there would have been so if if there was no beginning to time then sure infinite amount of time has already passed that's true now it's also true yesterday and the day before um and that's fine and someone saying well it couldn't have got here because it would have taken an infinite amount of time to get here just seems to be begging the question because well why why couldn't an infinite amount of time have passed just saying that something like there's too much time you know we would we would still be on our way here or something that just that i just don't understand these things that's just that's not right like th and if you think about just trying change change it around so we're talking about the future instead of the past now let's suppose there's no end to the future it just goes on forever um right so well why aren't we further down the future right it, it's going to take an infinite amount of time right there's infinite amount of time left so you but you know what he's worrying about like why now is now rather than at one of the future times one of the infinite future times it's just not an issue at all nobody thinks like that and yet it just seems completely symmetrical to me like it's taken an infinite amount of time to get here I don't really understand what the problem with that's supposed to be. If someone can explain that, I'd be very grateful. But I, I've read a couple of these types of arguments, and it just, it just, I don't, I think there's just nothing to that argument at all. That's like the worst uh, version of this argument, actually. Mm -hmm. So I would keep asking someone, yeah, but why do you think that's bad? What am I supposed to be worried about? Where are you going? Um, and all too often, it's very easy to say superficial things and, and feel like you're, you're mic dropping because you've said a habit that. That, you know we would have never got here boom i've won the debate or something but you know just a very slight shift in perspective and that's just not an issue at all it just doesn't seem like it's you know anything to be worried about whatsoever so that argument is kind yeah. of the kind of um uh traversing an actual infinite sometimes that's that's how that's referred to you can't traverse an actual infinite so actually the the, the germ of this argument i think i can explain this a little bit better is that like if you if you start off with a finite amount right like uh, if you're putting pennies into a jar or something and at each time you're putting a new penny in you can drop like one in maybe two or three or something but the number of pennies you can put in each time you put some in is just some finite amount so you can't in one go put infinitely many pennies in there and it starts off that there's a finite number let's say no pennies or like just one or something like that then you're going to keep on putting pennies in and at no point will there be infinitely many pennies in this jar right but and one way of thinking about why that's the case is that like if what you've got is a finite amount and adding any finite amount even if it's a million pennies or a hundred million or whatever it's never going to make the difference it's never going to transition the amount that you've got from being finite to being infinite Right? it's not finite amount it can never kind of go beyond the finite by just the addition of some finite amount right to do to make something that's finite manage to kind of escape like escape velocity or something that's going to get get away from being finite you need the addition of infinite all at once I mean, if i add an infinitely many pennies to one penny now i've got infinitely many pennies that's cool but if i can never do that big jump I can never escape the kind of finitude of what I've got in my jar and so that what they're thinking there is that like I'd have had to escape I'd have had to do this transition getting from finite to infinite for it to get to be that today infinitely many previous times have happened I'll have had to do this magic trick of going from finite to the infinite 
but all that's happening is one day is at being added at a time. We never get infinitely many times all added at once, right? So, so that's, I think, the best possible way of construing this argument. But still, it just seems like it rests on a com elementary misunderstanding because there's no transition from finite to infinite because at every previous day in the past, if there's no beginning, for every day, there's already been infinitely many days. Right? So that we're already, already on the other side of infinity on this. There's never a case where we have only had finitely many days and we need to break free of finitude to get to infinity. Yeah. There's, that we're, already, we're already there. As far back as yeah. you go, we're already there. So that's the misunderstanding, it seems to me, even with the best way of putting the argument. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Uh, so there's one thought experiment that is employed by the apologists here, and uh, I would I would like to you know hear your perspective. So this is like they say that let's suppose that there's a flower shop, and you have infinite flowers in front of the shop. You cannot open the flower shop until you count all the flowers. Mm -hmm. Let's say this is the condition you are, and since there's infinite. And infinite means endless. You will never, you never finish counting them, and it's impossible for you to open the flower shop. Here, okay. here you go. This is how the causal reality works. This event will not happen once that even infinite events are completed. Therefore, you know, infinities are impossible. So, how would you respond? Like somebody giving you this thought experiment, hey Alex, how would you solve this? <laughs> so, what okay. what will be your response? <laughs> So with it helps to do to have a little bit of mathematical resources like I'm not going to I haven't got a whiteboard I'm going to draw any pictures or any formulas or anything but let's just think for a moment about um a couple of different ways we could think of the numbers right so the, let's just think about the natural numbers so that's just the counting numbers so ignore fractions decimals everything like that just think of like one two three four blah 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 right so that is a sequence and at one end it's closed and at the other end it's open what i mean by that is just that there's a first number which is one or if you like zero however you want to pick right there's some but there's some first uh, number and then going up in the other direction in the kind of greater than direction there's no last number right for every natural number there's another one that you could count and now so it, the sequence has a beginning with one but it doesn't have an end it's endless now there's another type of sequence which is also infinite which is kind of a mirror image of that right which is like think of the negative numbers um so with that there's a last one that's minus one or zero, however you want to do it. But there's no like first number, because for every minus number, you can think of one, you know, one less than that, exactly the same reason. Yeah. So they completely mirror each other. And they're both infinite. So when we start counting the uh, flowers in front of the shop, if all we're doing is counting from one and then going up, then that's uh, a sequence which is closed at the beginning and open at the end. So it's, it's an endless sequence. And that's fine. And I think I would agree, okay, that if that's what we're doing, that's like dropping pennies into the jar. And that there's no point where I will have counted more than finitely many flowers. So um, the, the, so the direction of completion, unfortunately for me, is towards the open end of this sequence. So because there's no end there, I'm never going to get to complete this sequence. So I'm, I'm never going to finish. So I'll never open the shop. But the difference now is that when the apologist is talking about um, a beginningless past, they're not actually talking about something that starts and gets bigger and bigger and bigger. What they're talking about instead, if we needed to draw the analogy, is the negative numbers. And that, the direction of completion is towards the closed end, actually. So I can complete this, right? So if I've been counting flowers forever, there will only be so many flowers left right and you know it's like counting down if i've been counting forever and i'm counting you know minus a million and one minus a million minus nine hundred and ninety nine thousand nine hundred and ninety nine 
minus 999,998, that there's some finite amount of time before I'll finish. Right? So where, whatever stage I'm at, no matter how many I've got left, I'm traveling, my direction of completion is towards the closed end of this sequence. So that's good news for me because I will finish at some point and some finite point in the future. So I could have been counting down, uh, counting my way through the flowers forever and open at like three o'clock this afternoon because maybe I've only got a few flowers left and you know I'm good at counting them by this point. So I, I will get to finish that. So the apologist needs to make sure that their counting sequence is infinite in the right way. Like if it's infinite in a sequence that's open towards the direction of completion, then fine, fair enough, but I'm not gonna finish that. But then the issue is that it's not really analogous to the infinite past. Actually, it's more like the infinite future. If they really want to show why the infinite past is impossible, you need to have a sequence which is open in the other direction, right? The stuff that's just happened, but it's closed in the future direction, right? Like I've only got like 10 numbers left to count or something, and then I'll have counted all of the infinite numbers, right? If I'm, so a countdown, it seems to me, can be completed, even if it's infinite, but an infinite count up can't be completed. And there's a kind of asymmetry there. And what the apologist normally does is point to an infinite count up being impossible and then just say, and therefore an infinite countdown is impossible. But actually what they're doing is that they're appealing to something about, as I was saying, the direction of completion being in the open end of the scale. And then they say, well, so therefore it matches for this other sequence, even though that's not true on the other sequence, because the direction of completion is towards the closed end, right? So, so they're actually mm -hmm. asymmetric and they need to not talk about count ups, they need to talk about count downs. It's mm -hmm. actually much harder to find a reason that's good for why you can't complete an infinite countdown. And so anytime anyone gives an analogy like this, I'm thinking, okay, it's a count up, so it doesn't matter, it's irrelevant. Count ups are just not part of the, I'm just not interested in that whatsoever. And you never hear anyone really give you an example of counting down. Now, there's one type, <laughs> one type of analogy that I sometimes hear where you get this one where like, so there's a sniper and he needs to get permission from his yeah. uh, boss or whatever to shoot the target. But his boss needs yeah. to get permission from his boss. And so you have this idea that like the chain of permissions is going to go back forever. And then they need to also tell him that they've got the permission. So it's going to come all the way along an infinite chain towards the open end and then come back again towards the closed end. Well, that's not going to happen. I agree. But that's only because going in this direction is endless. Like there's an endless chain of people asking their superiors for permission. Yeah. But the direction coming from the superiors, you could just imagine that they didn't have to ask first. And just forever, there's been an endless chain of superiors telling their subordinates, yes, go and kill the guy. Next one tells him, yes, go and kill the guy. Yes. And that's been going on forever. And it just so happens that the last person hears it this morning at three o'clock or whatever, and he shoots shoots the dude. Now I'm not seeing a contradiction there, if you yeah. if you just have that yeah. one yeah. relevant chain. So, yeah, that's that's my view about that. Yeah. So, yeah. so in in short, you are trying to say that most of the thought experiments are not analogous to what is uh, the causal reality or if the time is infinite past stuff like that. That's right. Yeah, yeah. they're more about the infinite future, not yeah. the infinite past. Yeah, yeah. Many, right. you want, you want uh, to what... something. Yeah. So yeah, I was thinking, you know, so technically you can finish counting the flowers, right? If you do it in, uh, in the fashion of a Zeno series, right? For example, you, Graham you Opie. Yeah, yeah, kind of yeah. like super task. Yeah, yeah. So kind okay. of like a su super task, right? So imagine you have a ball, right? And and this ball is bouncing on my table, right? Mm -hmm. So it's it's up at one meters right now. It bounces on the table and then it goes back to 0.5 meters and then half of that and then half of that and none of that. Sure. It's going to, you know, stop at some point, mm -hmm. right? Each time the ball is bouncing, I'm picking one flower and, you know, putting it in the basket. So I have finished counted an actual infinite number of flowers when the ball stops, right? So, you, okay. uh, you know, it's, it's a super task, but you, you can technically finish completing 
a count of an actual infinite thing, right? Technically. Well, it will take you an, a finite amount of time to go through all of the steps. Yeah, that's true. Um, if, if I mean, you know, I have a lot of problems with this because, like, I, they're not physically realistic. I think, like, mm -hmm. you can't actually count a number in an in, in an arbitrarily small amount of time. You can't do anything like pick a flower in. Yeah. Maybe you could do it in half a second, but. Obviously, there is some fraction under which you, it's just physically impossible to do it. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so, I, you know, it just seems to me the relevance of these to anything like uh, what we call reality just seems like um, dubious. I mean, like, and anyway, like, think about it. If, if you, even if you could, um, you, you run into these things as a bit like Thompson's lamp. I don't know if you know this mm -hmm. paradox yeah. about super dark, yeah. but, you know, so you're switching the lamp on and off ever more yeah. quickly and quickly but then you know when you finished is it on or off you know it just feels yeah. like that that's problematic for a different yeah. type of reason and i'm not saying that that means super tasks are impossible or that the infinite is impossible anything like that but these those thoughts experiments are less clear to me like they're not physically realistic and they have other problems to them as well so like why why would someone who wants to rebut a theist here try and talk about super tasks because i think it doesn't help them if you want to try and make things clear you're bringing up something which has its own problems with it and it's not mm -hmm. realistic so it couldn't really happen but i don't think you need that in this case because the problem yeah. is with the person making the argument they haven't given an argument why mm -hmm. the infinite countdown is even impossible like they've given an argument that looks at something else so just keep their feet to the fire, keep pressing them to explain it and mm. question them about it. You don't need to go to the possibility of a super task because now you're on the back foot having to defend this. And, then, yeah. you know, as a strategy, I just wouldn't bring it up, I think, yeah. in this context. Yeah, right. Yeah. That makes sense. It's, it's easier to yeah. explain, you know, how their reasoning's wrong rather than, you know, bringing in another concept and trying to explain that to them. Yeah, that makes sense. That's right. You don't want to you don't want to shift the burden of responsibility to you now mm -hmm. having to defend something, mm -hmm. right? It's if they're making a case, they have to defend that case, and mm -hmm. all you need to do is pick it apart. Right. Yeah. Alex, yeah. what do you say to a theist who comes and say, "Okay, I'm going to grant you that uh, infinite past is possible, is traversable." So let's just say I'm sitting here and uh, some guy just comes four, three, two, one. Yes, I'm coming from the infinite past. And then five minutes later, another guy comes and says, three, two, one. Yep, I'm also coming from the infinite past. Yep. And there's some there's some kind of absurdity or something about that. Or uh, how do you respond to that? How can two guys come from the same infinite past and reach at two different times? Well, um you can say things about them that explain that like so let's say they've been saying the numbers at the same rate as each other forever so it's not like one of them speeds up and then sometimes forgets or something like that they've just always been doing it the same then there's nice easy facts about them so this guy was always three numbers ahead of the other one and they're counting it in, at the same rate as each other so that's why one of them finishes three numbers before the other one feels like a good explanation to me like what else are you looking for um you know so if it's just about contrasting why one finishes rather than at this time one of them finishes at the other you can talk about their differences in their in the numbers that they've been counting 10 years ago this guy was counting 17 billion and four and at that point this guy was counting 17 billion and five or whatever it was 17 billion and seven i suppose right and then they count at the same rate so that's why they've shuffled along together and they finish three numbers apart from each other i mean that, what else are you looking for right so it seems to me that there's there's something to be said there it seems like a perfectly good explanation um in a way it kind of entails it like if you say person a is counting at the same rate as person b and person a will finish in like 100 units time and person b uh, and then we say that they're three units apart from each other then it follows logically that person b finishes three units uh mm -hmm. after person a right because you can just pack in the information to like get an actual logical deduction of why 
one of them finishes at a different time to the other. Now, there's lots of things you can say that completely coherent, makes loads of sense. It is an explanation as strong as anything else. But someone might still say, yeah, but why, um, like just relating their actions to one another is one thing, but like, why, why is either of them doing either of those things? You know, um, you, you might phrase it in some like deeper question like that, or you might think, you might think about one person forgetting the second guy, first guy finishes now, why didn't he finish a minute ago or an hour ago or a million years ago? You might think this is how William Lane Craig puts it, that he had enough time already to have counted through all of the numbers yesterday or a million years ago. So how come he didn't finish a million years ago or yesterday? Why did he finish now rather than a million years ago? So when put like that, um, I think that, will re that initially sounds quite convincing. It does seem like, well, there must be no reason why he finishes today rather than some other day, right? Because he had enough time to finish it on a different day. So there you go. But actually, and it's sort of elementary logical error here, um, which, which is that like, so if you think about this conditional, right? Like if someone has been completing an infinite countdown, sorry, let's say if someone is completing an infinite countdown now, so he's on three, two, one, finishes right now, then it follows that he must have been counting for an infinite amount of time, because that's the only way you can finish an infinite countdown. I mean, assuming we're not talking about super tasks, right? A regularly spaced out countdown. If they finished it now, it follows logically that they must have been counting for an infinite amount of time. So it follows that there must have been an infinite amount of time, right? But it, think about it the other way around. If you say, well, if there's been an infinite amount of time, then someone would have been finishing a countdown now. That doesn't follow at all. Right. Just because there's been an infinite amount of time doesn't mean that somebody's finishing an infinite countdown right now. I mean, maybe there's been an infinite amount of time and nobody's been counting down through it at all. There's never been an infinite countdown, maybe. Right. There's nothing wrong with that, logically speaking. Um, so one of them entails the other. Right. One of them is a is a um, sufficient condition of the other and the other is a necessary condition of the first one. Right. And what William Lane Craig does, it seems to me, is to muddle these two things up because he's saying this guy who's finished counting down today, that means that there's infinite amount of time preceding that completion. And therefore, he should have completed it earlier. But it doesn't follow just because there was an infinite amount of time before today that anyone should have done anything. Uh, right. It, it just doesn't like the possibility that somebody could have finished a uh, previous time is not a reason to think that they should have done right it doesn't nothing entails that he should have finished yesterday and he actually uses the word should which is a really weird english word to use in this context because it's not like a strict straightforward logical uh like implication or like he would have finished or he must have finished or something like that should is almost like a kind of um like you should clean your room or you, you shouldn't, you know, eat with your mouth full or something like that. It's almost like a moral thing. It's like, why should he have finished yesterday, right? What he means is that because there's enough time, that entails that he finishes yesterday. But if you put it like that, it's just obviously false. Like there being enough time for him to finish yesterday doesn't mean that he did. And, and it just seems to me that's as straightforward as you need to get with it. It's just there's actually just not a logical reason that he would have finished yesterday just because there's enough time like think about it the other way around again right let's say i start counting now and there's an infinite future in front of me well i i could start tomorrow instead right because you know there's an infinite future and uh, there's just as much of an opportunity for me to count through all the numbers if i start tomorrow as there is today but it doesn't mean that i should start tomorrow right there's something like arbitrary about me starting today and I could do it arbitrarily, but maybe I've got a good reason for finishing, uh, for starting right now, right? Like nothing of interest really follows. Um, and in the future case is like very straightforward. I could start counting now or I could start counting tomorrow and either of those is fine. There's nothing logically problematic about it. But for some reason, when we switch it around and we start talking about the past, 
now William Lane Craig is talking about should. And, and like, where did that come from? <laughs> that just comes out of nowhere. So I just think this is an elementary kind of mix up. I'm not sure he's doing it on purpose. He probably isn't because why would you do that on purpose? But it's a, yeah, it's a mixture of um, confusing a necessary condition for a sufficient condition. So it's, you know, like I said before, that the implication is if I'm finishing infinite countdown now, then there was an infinite past. Fair enough. But it doesn't work the other way around. You can't say if there was an infinite past, then I'm finishing an infinite countdown now. That doesn't follow. That's wrong. It's obviously wrong. And when you spell it out yeah. like that and then realize that his argument is using the one that's obviously wrong, I think then the whole thing just disappears. And you realize that there's no problem there whatsoever. That's, yeah, that's fair. So um, how would you address then this claim that, okay, this is this sounds philosophically, this is fine, but science will is telling us that you cannot have an eternal past. Like, the second law of thermodynamics is saying that your uh, your entropy, you know, and I think I think the I, I'm I'm not sure of how, how they put it. I think they say that the energy is decreasing or something like the entropy is increasing or decreasing, and it cannot be past eternal. So uh, hence, science is telling us that uh, this is a uh, finite universe. So even if your philosophical defenses work, science is pointing to a you know, finite past. Well, um, so there's lots of things. So on specifically on this entropy question. So mm -hmm. generally, it's like the entropy is the the measure of disorder in a system, and they'll say it increases over time. So things get more and more disordered over time. But crucially, that's only for a closed system. Right? So it's talking about a system where the um, energy that's in the system is 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 uh, closed so there's not more energy coming in because obviously you can see pockets where entropy goes in the other direction right and so this is a statistical law that happens across the world in general um but you can think about so if, for instance the earth it's not a closed system because the sun constantly pouring energy onto the surface of the earth and that excess of energy that's coming in means that the earth often establishes things that are not in line with entropy so for instance the evolution of complicated life isn't towards disorder towards order the human brain is way more ordered and structured than like slime and like single celled organisms or whatever well, we've gone from being a state of high entropy where it's more disordered, so we say low entropy, where it's more ordered over time. And it seems like it goes against the second law of thermodynamics, but it isn't really. It's only because what we're talking about is the Earth isn't a closed system. It's a system with lots of energy coming into it from outside. So if you were to actually look at what the uh, second law of thermodynamics applies to, it has to apply to a kind of totality, where it's not getting any uh, you know, energy or whatever that can override this tendency towards entropy and so then what you've got to do is assume that the universe as a whole in, on its grandest of scales isn't getting any energy from anywhere else i mean and it, that starts to become a little bit flaky right like i mean i don't know if boltzmann or whoever it was who came up with this um law of entropy was able to say about what the universe is like in its sort of earliest stages or in its deepest levels of structure. But, you know, maybe before the Big Bang, there's um, a, a prior universe, right, which collapses down to a point, and there's some kind of energy bounce that kicks off uh, our phase of the universe. Now, if that's right, then what we're talking about isn't just one closed system that has an edge at the Big Bang, but actually that's like, like if we go back to the Earth equivalent, it's like the earth is just this thing but right next to it is something else that's pouring energy into it and then you can have contraventions of uh entropy and as far as i understand it and i'm not a physicist but as far as i understand these things the the theories about what is going on at the earliest points of the universe that we can measure are all over the place and there's lots of competing theories and they're often very different to each other and they're often very speculative so things things like big bounce 
or uh, multi-dimensional stuff or even just gravity in general, how that works, what it even is, what's going on there. It's, it's a field with lots of things that people don't really know for certain at all. And I think anybody resting too heavily on extremely speculative um, fringe areas of physics is liable to find that it doesn't really support the weight that they're trying to put on it. Like anything could happen almost in the theories, these speculative theories about the origins of the universe over the next period of science. Uh, we might find huge revolutions in how we think about this type of stuff. Um, or yeah. we might find that we can't get any, make any progress at all. Or maybe it doesn't go anywhere, but you know, there are lots of theories on the table. And the one okay. that says the universe began in the way that the theists talk about it, that type of theory isn't really the main theory, at least anymore. Um, so I think when it comes to the science, my I'm going to say, look, I'm not a physicist, so go and talk to a physicist about it. But if you really uh -huh. want to talk to me about it, if even then you still want to talk to me about it, I'll say it's really, really complicated. And the physicists don't agree with each other about that. Um, and a, phys a philosopher trying to tell you what the physicists should say about that feels wrong. Um, but yeah. I think until they can agree and get together on what they think, which they certainly don't at the moment, uh, we shouldn't really pay too much attention to it. Right. They should. It's interesting. It's fun. But like, don't base any life decisions based around what they say. Like, don't yeah. be Chris because science tells you the Big Bang. <laughs> happened, right? That would be crazy. Um, so, yeah, I would just park yeah. all of those things to do with physics, unless you're a professional physicist who specializes in that one particular bit of physics. Yeah, yeah. that's a really good answer. <laughs> <laughs> good. So I think we can quickly conclude like we have just two more questions. One is about fine tuning. What, okay. uh, what's your view about fine tuning arguments? Well, um, I guess I generally think that those fine tuning arguments, again, sound like they have a very high uh, scientific pedigree, and it can be difficult when approaching them as a lay person or even as a philosopher mm -hmm. to be able to it feels like you have to do lots and lots of very complicated physics to get your head around what's going on. Um, but I also think that these arguments generally have a kind of uh, soft underside. So when I did a debate with a, a guy, Luke Barnes, who's a, he's a Christian, but he's also a kind of astrophysicist as well. Um, and I said that it was a bit like a, an animal we have in the UK and I, guess I don't suppose you have it in in India so maybe this doesn't translate very well but it's like a hedgehog so it's um an animal which is spiky on the top but underneath it's just like a yeah, mouse or something have... it's like soft and it's porcupine. porcupine porcupine yeah exactly yeah. just like that so porcupine. it's yeah. the spiky bit is the scientific stuff but then the underside which is soft is that actually there's a load of just generic philosophy of religion and theology under there because mm. you still have to you still have to have things like um these basic questions that are not really scientific like god is good and god is all powerful and god like making humans is good and all these questions were like well maybe they're not true right maybe, you know maybe we could doubt those things if any of those are doubtable then all this fine-tuning stuff sort of becomes beside the point like imagine you were convinced that human existence is bad right so if you're a misanthrope someone who hates humanity um well, you're hardly going to be convinced that like God is good um, and he made humans and you can tell because of the fine tuning of the universe because you're not necessarily going to disagree with the fine tuning bit. You're going to say, hold on, a good thing would never make humans. The humans are horrible. <laughs> good thing would make some much better things than humans. They make like some mm -hmm. idealized like angel mm -hmm. versions of us, right? They wouldn't make this horrible version. Right? So, I mean, and now we're not doing physics, but you're still arguing about the fine tuning argument because yeah. they require these kind of theological things to go on in the background. So you shouldn't be scared of talking to um, someone who's running this type of argument because there's plenty of territory that you can cover which you've got nothing to do with physics, but that they need yeah. to establish in order to make the argument work in the first place. Um, yeah. So that's a general way of thinking about this type of argument. Um, I think you've done a video on this in, on, on your channel, but you know, 
Um, my favorite strategy when when it comes to like approaching the fine tuning argument is pretty much um, grant them everything that they're talking about, but then you know question how they get to the physical facts. You know why this loss of nature and why this psychophysiological loss and why mm-hmm. this constant yeah. and so on. I think I I I can't pronounce his name, but he you know he wrote this paper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Electrons and love. I, I love that yeah. paper, really. <laughs> oh, you, you should know? get him to come on and talk to you. He's he's a very nice chap, and he would have a good conversation yeah. with you. Yeah, he he's really good. I think his that that, that question is that, that that was something that I had in my mind. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, you could argue that God explains life and all of the good things that exist in the universe, but then. You know, God doesn't really explain the material facts that you know kind of comes into this thing, or, or the physical facts that c- comes into this thing. Why, wh- why do life exist in this particular manner with, with you know, uh, these constants and these laws of nature and these psychophysiological mm. laws? Yeah, I don't that's see any right. any good reason as to why God would have a preference on that (laughs) yeah and it feels like um the so so something about the way the argument works which is that like if some of these values were different then stuff would be very different that's that's the simplest way of putting but you know if gravity was a bit stronger then everything would cluster together and if it was a bit weaker everything would fly apart right and in either of those circumstances difficult to see how you could you know, have a conversation like this or whatever, and the stuff we take for granted couldn't couldn't happen. Um, but you know, if we tweak a bunch of the dials, so maybe we make gravity a bit weaker, but we make electromagnetism a bit stronger, whatever. So we're coordinating lots of values on the dials. I don't know that there isn't another bunch of settings that gives you stable structures. Maybe the matter as we know it wouldn't exist, but maybe some other thing would exist. And who knows if all you need is complexity or something, maybe we, some other type of life that could, could take place. I don't know about that. Um, but also, and it feels to me like nobody knows all of that. You're surveying this kind of infinite possibilities of com- combining physical constants together. Nobody knows. Nobody could possibly know all of those things. Physics is, is nowhere near being able to survey all of that type of thing. So, so it really just seems to me nobody knows there outside the kind of illuminated view very small area around where we currently sit if you change a couple of things things would be different but beyond that immediate setting we just don't know what what it would be like at all so um there's that idea but then also if you think about it why would god be so constrained right such that only you know combining these values in this way would mean that it's a very delicate balancing act I mean, isn't he responsible for how they combine together as well? Right? Where, did, yeah. where does that come from? And if exactly. he's completely all-powerful, then he should be able to do what he likes, including choosing what range of values is life permitting in the first place. So that exactly. the fine-tuning theorist wants to sort of have a pre-existing situation which is beyond God's control in order to argue that God, the supreme being who's all-powerful, must exist. And they're almost in tension with each other, those those two ideas. Like he should be able to overcome this weird property that, that they can only be combined in a very small amount of ways and just change it and do it differently. Um, so it being like that is almost evidence that he doesn't exist because if he did, yeah. you'd think he would just combine them in, in a way that was much more straightforward. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's, there's loads of little cracks in the fine tuning argument that are really interesting when you start diving into it. Yeah. Um, so I think it's a fruitful area to research. I don't think it's a stupid argument, but I also think it's far from uh, convincing or, or anything to worry about or lose sleep over. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think about the multiverse objection? Like a lot of people raise that the existence of multiverse may uh, solve the fine tuning problem. So what do you think about it? Well, it provides the... I mean, so a lot of the literature is set up where, um, it, you know, there are two competing hypotheses that explain the fine tuning. So the fine tuning just means if you change things a little bit, the structures we take for granted would become impossible. That's all fine tuning means. And then 
how do you explain, you know, that it's that the universe we live in is life permitting if it seems unlikely if you just set the dials at random that it would land on um a value that's life permitting like how come right so one view the theistic view is well that's what god wanted so that's why it happened so it being that way and unlikely to happen by chance is evidence that god did it but the multiverse hypothesis would say something like well what if the every possible way the dials could be set is a universe that's that is 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 like that now if that's right and there's a multiverse um then one of the ways the world could be is like this so this world would exist somewhere and then the idea is well it's not surprising that we find ourselves in the one life permitting universe because you couldn't exist in any other one apart from this one so like you have to be here so some kind of like anthropological reasoning or whatever you start from your own situation but it's like not surprising to find yourself here because this is the only one that you could be in, in the first place so i think that's sort of the most basic contours of how the multiverse uh idea has come into this it's that like it's a competing hypothesis to explain away the data as the theistic one so what i was trying to do a moment ago is get into the argument before you get to that stage to undermine the credibility of the theist um, idea in here anyway, just to say like, it's not clear that it's a good explanation. It requires all this theological baggage, blah, 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 blah. But the way the multiverse thing comes into it is you go much further down the track, concede a whole bunch of stuff and then say, well, here's a, here's a hypothesis that looks like it's at least as good as the theistic one at explaining the data. I mean, if all of the possible universes exist somewhere, in this multiverse then stops being surprising that this universe is life permitting because all we mean by this universe is the one that we find ourselves in and obviously we're going to find ourselves in a life permitting universe so does that does, does that make sense yeah but but then there is like this world objection against the multiverse objection right like why this world is fine-tuned the fine-tuning argument is not addressing like why this world is fine-tuned it just says that some world is fine-tuned and we happen to be in that world well but we so it's not like there's it's not like there was a lottery and you were sent packing off to one world like sent on a bus through a portal and mm -hmm. You know, there's a billion different worlds you could land in, and like most of them are just like energy levels that would destroy you immediately or whatever, or crush you immediately, stuff like that. And you just happen to land in the one that's life permitting, um, because there's a kind of selection effect. Like you wouldn't see anything unless you were in the life permitting universe. So, just asking the question in the first place, it's not. You're not saying well, why did I end up in a life-permitting universe? That's getting it wrong. Like, you had to be in a life-permitting universe. The question is, why is there a life-permitting universe at all? And then the think... multiverse explanation is just, well, every universe exists somewhere. So it's not surprising that a life-permitting one exists. Do you think you can draw... Either. Yeah, I, th I think that, that explains it. But, but do you think there's a parallel between, like, galaxies life permitting galaxies and life permitting universes you know when, when, it, when it comes to the multiverse it's it's sort of like you have a lot of galaxies right there are different types of galaxies you know some of them can permit life some of them can't permit life and you know the galaxies that can permit life has life in it right and uh -huh. you know the universes that can permit life has life in it and the universes that can't permit life doesn't have life in it so it's sort of the same thing right it's kind of like that yeah yeah the, the only difference i suppose is kind of radical dis differences between universes would be much more than the differences between galaxies in the same universe yeah. you know different galaxies in our universe have the same i mean presumably never been there to actually check this but presumably they have the same uh chemical structures and yeah. same laws of physics and stuff and maybe they have the same evolutionary processes for life that appears so although the life would be kind of different it would still it's still maybe they favor 
certain things like opposable thumbs or like two eyes or stuff. I don't know, maybe evolution yeah. like trends towards certain things. So they might be different, but if they're in the same universe, there's reasons to think that it wouldn't be that different. Whereas yeah. what we're talking about with, you know, fucking about with the fundamental forces of nature, yeah. things could be like totally different stuff. You couldn't yeah. even begin to imagine. Like, like I was saying, maybe they, there is like you switch the dials in a certain way and some kind of coherence appears. Um, it's it, we don't even have any kind of words to describe what that sort of thing would be like apart from structure mm -hmm. and i mean like would they be made of matter no well, not really not this type of matter would there be energy i mean kind of but not really they definitely wouldn't have the periodic table uh you know almost anything could be completely different so like yeah i think that's it's right as an analogy it's just that like what we're talking about here is so speculative and beyond everyday experience that people can get their heads around Certainly, even physicists who specialize in this, I think they're just, you know, nobody has, has surveyed all of these worlds and is able to tell you that nothing uh, even radically different to us could possibly exist there. I think anyone who tries to say anything like that is is making it up, frankly. Um, it's just a big question mark. You know, we, we can see a small region around us in terms of the possibilities, and then beyond that, it's just darkness, and we don't know. Um, so there could be something there that might not be. And we'll probably never know. I'll certainly never know. Anyway, for me personally, we'll never know that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not yeah. sure about that. Me neither. Yeah. And I'm fine yeah. with that. That's cool. You know. Yeah. Uh, do you think yeah. that uh, you can explain the fine tuning, a naturalist can explain the fine tuning with just this one universe? Like, there's no multiverse. This is the only universe that exists, and it just happens to be fine tuned. So, uh, does that sound like a good idea? you can i mean there are different strategies you could adopt for that i mean um it depends what you mean by this one universe right like what we were talking about a moment ago is a kind of idea of parallel worlds like the multiverse is like lots of different completely distinct space-time regions and they just sort of like all exist like, kind of next to each other but not really in space so like they're just yeah you know parallel but this worlds. universe by this universe just this constants like a uh, gravitational this value no other universe exists with uh, okay. different values so you can kind of fold the two ideas together a little bit so that you have um in this one universe there may have been like a preceding stage to it which is still the same universe in a way right it's connected to to ours temporally and spatially but um that things could have been slightly different in that universe and that something happens in the transition from one to the other that effectively spins the dials a bit and makes them randomizes them right so there's this genuine theory um by a guy um a physicist who does um quantum loop gravity what the hell is he called i can't remember um damn it anyway Ravelli so or a, someone okay it, well sorry Carlo Ravelli or I'm no guessing. it's not Ravelli okay. um anyway so this okay, idea is like that in black holes what's happening is that like matter and energy are um being crushed down into a singularity which then like spits out on the other side um as a as a big bang for a, another kind of continuation of the universe and that what's mm -hmm. happening there is like, some kind of selection effect it's a bit like evolution that kind of is random to some extent, but trends towards certain types of I think is it Lee Smolin? Lee, it's yeah. Lee Smolin, yeah, Lee there Smolin. you go. Yeah. Yeah. So on that view, you could have, like, it's basically one big universe, but it's got aspects that are a bit like a multiverse, and that there's some kind of process or disposition or something that's pushing the universe somewhat towards a certain type of set of characteristics, which might be a bit like ours. So you'd like to think if there were lots of different instances of this process giving rise to universe types and ours is just plicked at random, that it's probably kind of quite like most of them, right? So it's just a general principle that, you know, our, our sp spatial region is not radically different from the average. You just have to assume that unless you know any different. So if that's right, then you can kind of start thinking, well, maybe something is directing us, directing the universe towards being a bit like this. So maybe it's got some kind of mechanism that we don't understand quite yet that's directing it in this direction. 
and I mean, I mean who knows, right? Um, but you, you could, I guess you could. I mean, the difficult thing is just to say, like, well, there was just one. So there was a spin of the dials, and that it could have taken any value, and there are millions of you know, maybe infinitely many combinations, um, and it just happened. It span once, and it just happened to land on this one. And this is yeah. the only one that could support life. Like if you have to swallow all of those pills, then it does seem like it's quite difficult. Um, but yeah. that's, you know, you just need a bit of imagination to wonder about what you might do. So this kind of quantum loop gravity stuff is an imaginative way of thinking about how things, I mean, he's not doing it to get around the fine tuning argument and he's not yeah. interested in that whatsoever. It's a theory in its own right, but it's just got this direct application to why entropy is the way that it is at the beginning of the universe and like why um the constants are the way they are and like what a black hole is and what the fuck's going on with all of this stuff like it's um it's like a cool use of imagination and reason that has lots of applications it kind of makes sense of it out of this if you if you're like really determined that there's only one universe but you like this type of idea then that gives you a lot of resources that you could use to come up with a response if you wanted to I guess. I mean, it would be difficult to say, I know that Smolin's right here. I mean, that you, you shouldn't say that because um, even he doesn't know that he's right, of course. Yeah. But it's just a possibility that's on the table. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so um, I think, you know, the earlier approach we were talking about, like uh, the approach that Neil is he, the one that he is taking. I think that yeah. pretty much shows that the options are the same on both sides. You know, the naturalists have the same options as the theists to explain okay. uh, the fine tuning, really, right? Because um, the theist doesn't have an advantage in explaining the physical facts about the universe, right? And life, if you're a materialist or a physicalist, life can just be reduced to these material facts, mm -hmm. right? So under theism, you know, um, the laws of nature. Why, why do, why does the universe have this kind of a law? law of nature right that's just a brute choice by god it doesn't have an explanation really you know why did god choose these kind of constants uh, as the life permitting constants and why did he put these values in um just brute right so all of mm -hmm. these physical facts are just brute and i think the naturalists could also argue yeah yeah these physical facts are just brute as well but then you don't have god in it you know you could argue that they're necessary or something like that Right. And then, mm -hmm. you know, you would still explain life because life is just reduced to these physical facts. Right. You can reduce life to these physical facts. So, you know, you have a naturalistic account of a uh, of, of fine tuning. Right. And it's as good as the theistic account. Right. Yeah, I like that. So it makes it sound like the fine tuning argument is basically just a version of the cosmological argument because. Yeah. There's just lots of contingent things, and the contingent things we're focusing on here are the dials of the fundamental parameters of the universe, like the strength of gravity, yeah. weak nuclear force, that type of thing. Um, and they're contingent. Something must explain them. They think God's choices explain them. But yeah. then you could run the type of thing I was saying before of like, well, if God's just choosing that, then what explains why he chose gravity to be this value and the speed of light to be that value? Like, why didn't he yeah. pick different ones for that? Um, yeah, and and if they're just contingent, you may as well. If they don't have an explanation and they're contingent, then it's no better than a naturalist just saying, "Well, I just spun the dials, man, and it just landed like this, <laughs> so we're lucky, I guess." You know? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's not like you know. Sometimes when you're talking to people who are religious, I think what they want you to do is like say what you believe and like defend your worldview against their worldview yeah. and sometimes it can be quite frustrating i think from their point of view because then they'll come find someone like me who give well on the one hand this and over here we could say that and there's this possibility here and blah 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 and i say yeah yeah but which one do you actually believe in <laughs> and it's quite difficult to sort of get across the fact that like i don't believe really any of these things in particular you know yeah. i i'm quite just quite happy not knowing whether Lee Smolin's theory is right or whether, you know, some other guy's theory is right. It's none of my business, you know. It's certainly yeah. above my pay grade to know anything about that. But, um, you know, why should I pick one? Well, in a way, it's just kind of, um, I suppose it makes their life easier if you pick one thing 
Um, but you know, the reality is, if, from a philosophical point of view, if somebody's making an argument, um, they have to support that argument itself. They don't have to support it only against your worldview or something. So it really doesn't. It shouldn't matter what I believe. Your argument will work uh, independently of what I believe, basically. So from a yeah. philosophical point of view, there's a big difference with apologetics. Um, and I also think there's something about like this mindset of what it is to be religious is, um, and, and maybe this is a facet of Western religion, kind of like dogmatic Christian or Islamic or Jew Jewish kind of outlook on things where like what it is to be religious is to like believe these specific things in this book, read this one particular way right we we are we say these things on this day of the year and we eat these things and we sleep with people of this type and and you know we're, we're defined by this kind of like rule book yeah. of things our doctrines or whatever and if you're not religious or i mean presumably if you're religious in a different way i mean i guess i my very poor understanding of it my understanding of like hinduism is is like not quite as rigid like that it's like loads of different varieties yeah. and stuff in there whatever i'm not saying hinduism is better because of that but like i certainly it's focusing on what i i know i think that like the religious people i encounter when discussing these types of things they just have a world view where you should have made your mind up on all of these questions and like mm -hmm. you have a doctrine and that's what you believe you think the universe is finite you think all contingent things have an explanation you think i don't know whatever every, for every philosophical question you've got an answer because that's the type of thing that you think now non-religious people and i think just philosophers in general are more likely to say well on the one hand this and on another hand that and you know i don't know and like i smear my beliefs out in degrees over lots of different options i don't just plonk it all into one basket and just believe that and nothing else i'm open-minded about lots of things and you know, I find things attractive and things unattractive or things plausible and implausible. Sometimes I think things are obviously outright false, but a lot of the time it's it's a gray area. So we're back to that sort of ambiguity and mystery or something. And I think that's if I have a worldview, it's a it's like that. It's a gray area rather than black and white. Anyway, yeah, I'm not quite yeah, sure how I, I that's, tangented that's, into that. So <laughs> hopefully no, that but I think that's a good good that's absolutely sometimes how i see it so i could relate cool yeah, yeah. um i think we then could the ask situation the also question. is Pradesh, the situation yeah, i think is also same in india right like recently we mm -hmm. invited a team for a debate on a topic does god exist mm -hmm. so yeah. they made a strange request that the thing they said is okay we will argue that god is necessary but you as an atheist should argue that god is impossible like so so it's right. like a weird uh, uh, yeah weird way of putting a topic for a dp yeah yeah we get that all the time <laughs> yeah yeah uh, so uh, there is this uh, argument not like an argument so when we compare to the god and our naturalism so usually the naturalists will say the initial state of the universe is necessary and the theists will say that god is necessary and uh, okay. this is asking us like oh the initial state it changes it changes from one thing to another it's not the same the initial state doesn't exist anymore so can you still call it necessary it's changing it's not the same through all of time i think they're using another sense of the word necessary but they have that sense like a necessary being is always unchanging so if it yeah. changes it's lost its necessity or some something like that it, if it's not the same throughout it's changing it or it has parts that change then you can't actually call it necessary because there are states of the world in which that initial state doesn't exist so wh what do you think about that so i mean these days analytic philosophy in general just like not controversially at all just distinguishes between uh things that exist um necessarily and things that exist permanently and they're not the same uh they're not overlapping concepts oh they are overlapping they're not completely overlapping concepts so um what it what does it mean to be necessary well the general working definition is 
um, and this isn't particularly helpful, but like I think it's helpful in this context is that like for it to be something to be necessary just means that it exists in all possible worlds, right? So any any way that a world could be, it exists in that world, and in, in if that's if that condition is met, then that thing is necessary. Um, what does it mean for something to be permanent? Well, it means that uh, at every time uh, this thing exists. So you could imagine now we've got those definitions in hand, something, you know, some world W and a thing, let's say A, such that that thing exists throughout every time in that world, right from the first moment to the last. So with respect to that world, this thing A is a permanent feature. It's always there. Um, but you might then find another world B where A doesn't, or some other world W2, say, where A doesn't exist at all. So it doesn't exist in all possible worlds, even though in some worlds it's permanent. So it can be contingent and, you know, whenever it exists, it's permanent, uh, right? That's perfectly consistent. It, these just seem like combinations that you can have if you use the definitions like this. Um, don't see that there's an argument that says you couldn't have something which exists in some worlds, but not others. But in some worlds where it does exist, it exists at every possible time. I don't see any reason to think that's impossible. But all that does is establish that they're not always the same, these two concepts. So just because something is not permanent doesn't mean it's not necessary. It might still exist in every possible world. So maybe every possible world begins with the same type of singularity, and that exists in every possible world. And in every possible world, it immediately stops existing as soon as it's done its creative act. I mean, cool, that sounds like a fun story. I don't know if it's true or not, but I can't see a contradiction with that. Um, and it, you certainly don't just get to say, well, necessary means always existing. It doesn't mean that. I mean, that's not what philosophers, that's not how philosophers use the term. I mean, you can just adopt your own definition if you want to, and that's fine. Um, but if your opponent or your interlocutor doesn't agree with those definitions or wants you to, you know, if you just recognize that, like, using the word that way, uh, you, you could even say, OK, cool, according to your definition, right, necessary means always existing and existing in every possible world. But now let's use another concept, let's call it necessary, which is what the philosophers mean by necessary. And then just, you know, rebadging yeah. a concept with a word doesn't win, can't possibly win an argument because you just construct the argument using the concepts and you don't care what actual words are being used. That's irrelevant. You just have to agree a common language of terminology so that when you're making an argument, the other person knows what you mean. But just simply changing the definition, uh, that's just kind of a, a cheap trick or something. Um, so I would just, it, I guess it can be difficult when the concepts are, are not familiar and you have to rely on the words and, and this type of thing. But yeah, it's just, I don't know, I don't know how to reply really, but apart from to say, that's just not how philosophers use the terms. So if someone is yeah. insisting on using the terms in a way that deviates from what everybody else is doing, I'd want to know why. You know, it's a dead giveaway, really, that they have to use it that way to win the argument. Because if you know, why not just talk like everybody else? Yeah, that just confuses the conversation. That's it. That doesn't really help to progress the conversation. Yeah, and sometimes yeah, people was... do that on purpose, and sometimes people will just uh -huh. be confused as well, and they won't really know that they're getting it wrong. It's very difficult. Yeah, yeah. yeah that so... was really helpful. Yeah, man, you can ask yours. So my final question is: um, Okay. So now that you've uh, had some experience in philosophy of religion and read many arguments and so on, you have these sort of arguments right like problem of evil that are, that are proposed by people like paul draper mm -hmm. and then divine hiddenness arguments like schellenberg and so on and then you have um these competing theistic arguments from william Lane craig alden plantinger and the theistic side uh, richard, richard swinburne fine-tuning argument blah 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 when you see all of these arguments um what do you think about the arguments on both the sides. What do you think about the arguments on the naturalist side? What do you think about the arguments on the TS side? You know, like, um, which do you think is better or stronger? Or... Well, like I said at the beginning, I don't really think the arguments are the right way to figure these things out. Like, they're, they're not 
they're not things that make much of a difference to me anyway. Like I'm not, um, I guess you would call me a naturalist and, you know, the word means lots of different things to different people, but I guess I'm an atheist. Right? I mean, I don't believe that, you know, the kind of Christian version of God exists. Right. So, um, but it's not like I was open-minded and then read Paul Draper and uh, Richard Swinburne and, and like evaluated the arguments and, you know, made a spreadsheet and then counted all of the things and came up. Oh, it means now that God doesn't exist, so I'll be an atheist or something. I was an atheist from birth, basically, and I've never been religious, and I just don't see any reason to change my mind. So I've never seen yeah. any good theistic arguments that were remotely plausible or I mean, interesting, absolutely, but not remotely plausible. It's so unlikely, and you know that I think that probability of christianity being true is not zero but it's so close to zero that it may as well be for all my you know i i just have no worry whatsoever about jesus yeah. judging me and throwing me into hell or something it's just obviously not even remotely likely um so from my point of view I think all of the arguments are interesting. Some of them are not that interesting, I guess, like the mathematical one. I don't even think that's very interesting, but like things like the Kalam, they involve lots of fun topics like infinity and like time and all this cool stuff mm -hmm. and big bang theory, blah, blah, blah. So it's fun. So if an argument's fun and I'm interested in reading about it, but um, I don't really think that they're, they're good for sorting out, like I said, confusions and working out whether you believe contradictory things so they can be useful from a psychological point of view. I think they can be dangerous if you use them to try and hit people over the head with them to make them believe the same thing that you believe in, or you reassure yourself that you're believing the right thing by constructing this big castle of rationality that you live in and that no one can get you because you've got all of these ar cool arguments figured out or something. Like, I guess you can do that if you like, but it seems a bit weird to me. Um, so. I don't really, I don't know. I, I guess I just kind of don't really care if if there's a if there are good arguments for atheism or good arguments for theism. I just think arguments like that are not going to persuade me one way or the other anyway. Um, and if there are good arguments, that just means there are fun arguments and interesting arguments. Uh -huh. um, so maybe that's not very helpful. Um, yeah. You want to have a rational basis for your naturalism or something, and I, I don't think I'm the guy to give that to you, uh, uh -huh. right? Yeah, I mean, which I one would you yeah. say is the most fun argument? At least. <laughs> oh, the Kalam, I think, is the most fun argument. Most Definitely. Fun argument. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, th this is similar to what uh, Graham Oppie, you know, said. You know, when we asked him the same question, mm -hmm. right? He gave us these same answer because his his approach and. I, I think his approach towards arguments is similar to yours, right? I think what what he adds is, um, you know, his theory based uh, approach towards worldviews, right? Comparing naturalism and theism, and yeah, I think he's more ambitious than I am, though, because I think yeah. his idea is at least that you would compare all of the evidence to try and come up with a worldview where, yeah. um, so it's like it's really theory choice, and you're weighing up loads yeah. of different things possibly hundreds of different data points to try and um make an evaluation um yeah. i guess i'm saying if i'm saying anything it's that like i don't really know if i have a big world theory like that um i think i'm more opportunistic i have opinions about certain things and i don't think they add up to a worldview and i think i'm fine with that um yeah. i kind of think that big theory choice is probably too much for me to handle anyway. I'm just not that type yeah. of person. And um, I'm not, I don't really see how that I have to do that uh, at all, you know? Um, and I kind of also think, you know, to some extent, this idea of worldview is a creation of religious people anyway, as a way of like kind of carving out distinctions between themselves. Yeah. Um, and it's not clear that you have to have that um, or that your worldview needs to have the same fundamental starting points you know like you certain these presuppositionalist people will say you have to have a view about you know the nature of space and time and morality and blah 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 but they don't say that you have to have a view about you know your, that your fundamental worldview has to be about um whether pizza tastes nice or 
uh, if you like, you know, classical music or something like that. But why not pick those questions as being the things that are more important to you as the like fundamental defining aspects of your personality or the way that you look at the world? Why does it have to be the classic philosophical concepts that are your worldview? Um, you know, I, I'm much more, I can give you a much more straightforward answer if you ask me those types of questions. So like, uh -huh. I don't have much to say if you would try and ask me what's the fundamental nature of reality. But I can tell you who my favorite you know, composer is because that's you know that's what I'm actually spending my time doing is listening to music and eating pizza and uh. like chilling and stuff. I'm not like always writing philosophy. When I do write philosophy, it's also as a as a hobby. It's something I'm doing hobby. because it's fun and it's interesting. So I think there's sort of that yeah, it's a kind of mindset of just seriousness. I suppose I'm just not. I don't approach philosophy in that same seriousness. I'm, I do it because I like doing it and. Yeah, um, that maybe that means I don't have a worldview, or I'm not the type of philosopher that, that can sort of manage it. I'm too scatterbrained yeah. and not serious enough. Yeah. So, who, who's your favorite philosopher? Then? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I quite like. So, when I was doing my PhD, I really liked um, this guy called Arthur Pryor, who uh, was a logician who pioneered like temporal logic. Um, and he used to be a Christian and he became an atheist. So that was that was kind of I mean, I never I was never a Christian in the first place, but it was fun uh, relating to his like later religious views. Um, I really like Graham and and Paul. They're both they're both really cool people. Um, but, you know, I like Josh Rasmussen as well. I think his some of his work is like really beautiful. You know, some of the he has this argument it's called the new problem of well, actually i can't remember what the paper's called now but it, it involves this proof and it's like a really beautiful kind of uh symmetry that goes on when you work through it that's really lovely um uh yeah so i guess i really like schopenhauer as well um mm. uh really grumpy um person um i i guess i'm an epicurean in a certain sense as well you kind of like live in the moment and enjoy simple pleasures right and kind of believe in the epicurean uh idea there so i guess i owe a lot to him too um yeah i, I could keep i could keep talking you're gonna have to tell me to stop talking <laughs> i don't have one fake <laughs> philosopher there's there's loads of philosophers yeah. that are interesting that you can dip into yeah. um none of them get everything right uh, yeah yeah uh in the beginning you said you had just published one paper so any can you can you share what is it about yeah okay so this is um so it's a paper about uh do you know who andrew loke is yeah, yeah. yes yeah. Yeah. Oh, is it the one that you wrote, wrote with mess with mess no, no, no. no 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 i did write you had a debate you had a debate oh. with Andrew Locke and even Opie had a little bit with Andrew Locke, right? Now. Yeah, so, that's right. Okay, but actually, you're right. In that paper with Morriston, we did to discuss Locke a bit at the end. That's true. Uh -huh. um, so, so that guy, um, I wrote a paper about his. Um, he's very prolific, strange man. He's written two books on the Kalam in the last like four years, which is crazy, like just insane and just this year he has two books out one on the kalam and one on the problem of evil and i just don't understand anyone could be, could be that prolific so uh -huh. anyway i uh, i read basically both of the books on the kalam and a bunch of his papers on there uh -huh. and came to the decision that there was a chunk of his work which basically was just all a big big mess big horrible mess and um so i wrote a thing about that explaining what was wrong with it and i sat on it for ages and some friends of mine persuaded me that i should send it somewhere um so i did i sent it to a journal that he's just been published in because it's always a bit dangerous if you write a paper that's just saying here's a guy who's wrong about loads of stuff that <laughs> a journal won't want to publish it because it's like you know it's a bit sort of personal and um, it's not just on its own discussing an idea, it's discussing it through the lens of why someone is wrong about that idea. So mm. it's it's almost, you know, that's why I was a bit reluctant to write it, because it's sort of rigorous. I spent ages doing it, so it's more than a blog post. Mm. But sometimes they, these journals won't necessarily want that. But 
I don't know, this International Journey Journal for the Philosophy of Religion uh, said yeah in the end. So um, it'll be coming out and explaining why he gets the successive edition argument all wrong, just all upside down and back to front. So yeah. I can send you a, a cheeky draft of that if you're interested. Oh, we would oh. love that. We would love we that. Would. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've I've read two of your papers, right? Um, one called "All the Time in the World" and okay, yeah. "Endless and Infinite." Right. Mm -hmm. Infinite, yeah. So the one the one you wrote in 2020 and the one you wrote in 2022. So yeah. These are the cool. two papers that I've read. <laughs> well, they're the ones. And your blog is also say, uh, very cool. Yeah, your I would say you you okay. your those two papers made me confident on defending the infinite. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, and your well, blog I, is I, really. I, okay. Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> but yeah, your your <laughs> blog is really helpful as well. You know, th th there's a lot of really good stuff on there, and yeah, obviously your YouTube channel. You know, that's also really <laughs> wonderful. Okay, yeah, I hope nice you resurrect know. your tautology podcast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we'll see. I I have to find someone who wants to come on and talk to me about something. But yeah, if I do, I'll let you know about that as well. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay then. I think shall we end this? Um, yeah. Okay. Yes. Cool. Uh, well, thanks very much Alex. for having me on. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Doctor Alex. You, Alex. Alex. For no problem. <laughs> hope, hope, hope you'll come in the future as well if we have any topic to discuss. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. And let's stay in touch. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Bye. Cheers, guys. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thanks.